This Fleet Equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment, and welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. Today, we're talking with Scott Baker, Vice President of Engineering at Westport Fuel Systems. Scott, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Jason. My pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, and excited to talk with you too, especially given the background with Westport and all the different changing fuel types in the commercial vehicle industry right now. Lots of changes on the horizon uh, and maybe some technologies that, that have been around or are seeing a resurgence. So let's start there specifically with natural gas. As fleets are going through decarbonization efforts, looking to lower their emissions, be more sustainable. Are you seeing any shifts in interest of natural gas powertrains and, and how fleet customers look at it from a decarbonization option? Yeah, good good question. I'm happy to talk about that, having been in this, uh, in this industry for a long, long time. Um, natural gas engines and natural gas powered commercial vehicles have been around for decades, um, originally started around, uh, around emissions reductions, particularly around criteria pollutant reductions, NOx emissions and particulate matter emissions decades ago. That conversation is increasingly shifting towards decarbonization in, uh, in recent years. And we strongly believe, and many of our customers do as well, that uh, natural gas, uh, natural gas engines, natural gas commercial vehicles can be, and in fact are available today as a very highly cost-effective means of deep decarbonization efforts. Um, natural gas as a fuel is the simplest hydrocarbon fuel. Um, so inherently through just combustion of, uh, of methane, as opposed to combustion of any other hydrocarbon fuel, there are inherent CO2 reductions right there. And then uh, depending on the, the, the source of the natural gas fuel, particularly biomethane or renewable natural gas, um, there can be a much more significant carbon reduction available on a full fuel cycle or so-called well to wheels basis, depending on the fuel source. Right. Really cool to hear, especially since, uh, you know, you look at emissions reductions, right? Natural gas, uh, it's not zero emissions, but it's substantial in its reductions of emissions. Do you see that? Do you see customers valuing that reduction or is it like a zero emissions or bust kind of conversation? So, yeah, really good question. So maybe let me, to, to answer that, maybe let me put some numbers, some quantification to what I mentioned earlier. The, the in, inherent reduction in tailpipe CO2 simply by combusting methane, again, it's the simplest hydrocarbon molecule, um, there's about a 20% reduction in CO2, tailpipe CO2 emissions, just simply through burning methane as opposed to burning a liquid hydrocarbon fuel. Wow. So right there, you're getting a 20% benefit, which is significant in, in itself. Right. Where it can be much more significant, and in fact can be 100% decarbonization on a net CO2 reduction basis is where you take into consideration the full fuel cycle. So biomethane or renewable natural gas, which it, which occurs in uh, things like uh, biodigesters, uh, methane recovery from landfills, for example, sewage right. treatment plants. Um, on, a, on a greenhouse gas accounting basis, depending on that particular fuel pathway and then fuel distribution pathway to the end user, that actually can be uh, up to 100% reduction of CO2 on a, net, on, on a net basis. So it in fact is a net zero carbon solution when using fuel from a, a renewable source. Right, now, well, and to your point too, that goes to understanding the whole cycle of where you're getting your fuel and how you're using uh, your fuel and the emissions. Because even in, even in uh, tailpipe zero, like battery electric, right? If you're charging your trucks with coal power, that's not technically net zero. It's zero at the tailpipe, but you're still, bur you're still burning coal to get the original energy uh, uh, to charge the truck. So I think you speak to an important uh, idea that you know you really got to work to get your arms around and work with your partners and work with uh, even your internal team to be able to report on that and understand that holistic picture. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. Um, the, the the reality and it, it is a reality, but it's a, sometimes it feels like a bit of a headwind at times. Is that this this space, the on highway commercial vehicle space, from a regulatory perspective? forever has been, or for many decades at least, has been regulated on a tailpipe basis or a tank to wheels basis. 
there is no regulatory mechanism within the EPA car bureau emission regulations for vehicles and engines to take into consideration that upstream fuel source and the, the, the carbon footprint associated with the well to tank portion of the full fuel cycle. It's a critical element of ultimately addressing climate change, which of course is a global um, consideration, not just limited to local source emissions, but it, it makes the story not all that intuitive at times. So yeah, there's an education uh, and public outreach and government outreach aspect to, uh, to what we do. Right, right. Let's go back to the equipment real quick, because, you know, I think, I feel, maybe this is just my personal take on it, but I feel like natural gas doesn't quite get the credit it deserves in the commercial industry. You know, uh, I mean, even even this past week, I was at a, a trucking event and I was at my hotel. I was getting ready to leave in the morning, right? A truck pulls up to, to make a delivery. And only then do I realize, oh, that's a natural gas CNG truck. You just don't think about it. You don't realize that they're out there in operations. They're out there working already. But how has natural gas uh, in engines evolved over the years to really meet the demands of today's applications? Yeah, good, good question. So maybe let me give a little bit of a history lesson here. So natural gas engines for commercial vehicles um, started becoming commercially available in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. And to be perfectly honest, they didn't have a very strong reputation um, because they were at that point in time immature in terms of performance and cost effectiveness and reliability and durability. Um, through the efforts of Westport and other players in the industry, that story has evolved dramatically to the point that there's a wide range of natural gas engine options available with a bunch of different uh, techno underlying technologies um, to suit a wide range of end use applications. Um, natural gas engines and natural gas commercial vehicles really have evolved to become fully developed, high performance, um, highly reliable, highly durable pieces of equipment to meet a wide range of needs for a bunch of different fleet applications. Um, just to turn this back to, to Westport's product line and, and the products we offer from light duty passenger car applications through heavy duty on highway, um, both OEM first fit products and retrofit applications for existing vehicles. We have a number of different technologies, including a um, low pressure uh, dual fuel solution for retrofit to heavy duty trucks in emissions lagging markets, um, as well as spark ignited natural gas engine management systems um, for light duty and commercial vehicle applications. And then our technology that we uh, develop um, here in, in Vancouver, where I'm based, which is our so-called HPDI or high pressure direct injection technology that uh, enables diesel cycle engines to run primarily using a gaseous fuel, natural gas in the case of their commercially for class eight truck industry. Right, right, right. Uh, let's switch. Well, and you know, one quick thing on there too, and uh, the infrastructure is there, right? Even off the top of my head locally, I can think of uh, several places where I can fill up on natural gas uh, as, a, as a vehicle too. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a component that if you can wrap your arms around the, the entire uh, fuel usage and emissions cycle that, you know, it solves a lot of those issues. But again, it requires that, that really kind of detailed look at it. Yeah, so of course, refueling infrastructure is is uh, is a consideration, but that's uh, that has been growing and expanding aggressively throughout the world. So uh, some some recent uh, recently publicized numbers um, in Europe, um, there's now over 700 LNG stations throughout Europe. Obviously, not as many refueling stations as uh, as currently exist for diesel fuel, but that number has advanced very aggressively in recent years. To re have recently surpassed 700. In North America, NGV America, the, the Natural Gas Vehicle Association for, for the United States, um, publicizes on their website that there's approximately 2,000 natural gas refueling stations available. That number has grown aggressively and continues to grow. Um, people talk a lot about the chicken and egg conundrum. Um, it's a consideration for sure, but particularly with commercial vehicle applications, um, what we've seen in most cases is that if a commercial vehicle fleet um, is, states their intent to uh, to introduce natural gas into their operations, in most cases they're not just buying one or two or a handful of vehicles. They're they're making a sizable commitment to transition a particular operating location to natural gas. That creates a business case right there for a fuel station provider to put in a, a private refueling station or perhaps as a public. 
public access station. So we've, we've really not seen in most cases that it is in fact a chicken and egg problem. It's that the, the, the market demand will drive the evolution of the fuel station for the particular fleet. Right. Okay. I'm going to switch gears here, Anya, because there's a growing topic in the industry uh, that you all are working on as well in hydrogen ice. So internal combustion engines using hydrogen. Can you just give me an idea of where are we at uh, with that technology? How far is it from being market ready? And, and how does that work in the decarbonization world? Yeah, so really, really great question. So um, this has been a really fascinating um, recent evolution that, that we've been part of and we're also seeing throughout the industry is that um, a lot, lot more discussion, in fact, widespread discussion about hydrogen combustion as part of the long-term um, decarbonization strategy. Whereas until even just a few years ago, to the extent that anyone was talking about hydrogen in transportation applications, it was really exclusively around fuel cell applications. And certainly we expect fuel cells to be part of the long-term mobility decarbonization strategy going forward. Um, but as a largely combustion-based company, um, we're, we're motivated and encouraged by seeing the, uh, the, the groundswell around hydrogen combustion. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, throughout our existing natural gas product line, we have a range of technologies, diesel dual fuel, spark ignition and our HPDI technology. We're actively migrating um, all three of those technology platforms to, uh, to hydrogen capability. Um, to your question about um, the status of that technology and product evolution and market readiness, um, the answer to that really depend varies depending on uh, which of those three underlying combustion technologies we're talking about. Um, the, the earliest product that we expect to be to come to market with a, a hydrogen option is our, our retrofit uh, diesel, um, uh, pardon me, diesel dual fuel technology. Um, we expect that to be commercially available um, within the next year or two, I would say, um, depending on uh, which country uh, in, in Europe, some of the countries are more aggressively uh, supporting the, the development, um, both from a funding perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective, having a regulatory mechanism to make those vehicles with that uh, conversion technology legal for road use. So we're really looking forward to that, which will be uh, a key enabler of, of driving demand for hydrogen consumption that can then build out the refueling infrastructure for the eventual uh, arrival of true dedicated monofuel hydrogen um, solutions. Uh, Spark, I mentioned our Spark Ignited engine management system technology. Um, that's where we're actively underway on uh, on applying hydrogen versions of that in conjunction with uh, some OEM partners in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've mentioned earlier our high, high pressure direct injection technology that uh, commercially available for heavy duty trucks now with natural gas. Um, we've demonstrated on multiple different OEM engine platforms the um, performance and efficiency capability of that technology uh, with hydrogen. Um, we're in the uh, early product development phase right now. I think uh, you and your audience are well aware that in the commercial vehicle industry, product development cycles are typically on the order of about four years. Um, so that would say that uh, for, for that particular technology to come to market as a first fit OEM validated product, we're looking towards the end of the decade uh, when we expect commercial availability of, uh, of that product through OEMs. Right, right. Well, I, and, and I mean, that might seem like a little ways out, but it's really like one truck life cycle uh, at best, right? When you could, when you could exactly. get trucks, right? So it's even, yeah. it's even less now when, when trucks are a little harder to come by. One quick follow up for you before I let you go. Uh, can you explain to me what the dual fuel is? So you have dual, the diesel dual fuel. Can you just give me a little quick summary of, of how that works? Yeah, so the way that technology works is uh, it, it's a retrofit technology um, where you take a, an existing diesel engine in a, in a heavy duty truck, um, add to the vehicle um, a, a gas storage system, either a compressed natural gas cylinder or a, typically a small liquefied natural gas fuel tank, um, and then add the natural gas to the intake manifold at low pressure. So it's still diesel cycle combustion, but uh, inducing a, a mixed charge of natural gas and, and charge air, as opposed to, of course, just charge air in a, uh, in a, in a typical diesel setup. Um, 
definitely not a, a monofuel technology. It's, it's really limited. That technology is inherently limited in its fuel substitution to somewhere on the order of 50 or 60% of the fuel being natural gas, yeah. um, as opposed to our HPDI technology that has more like 95% um, of the, uh, the fuel energy delivered through natural gas. Um, because that HPDI technology is a, is a direct injection technology where we're replacing the entire fuel system, not adding a supplemental gas fuel system to the existing diesel injection system. I see. That makes sense. I appreciate it. Scott, I learned a ton here. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure we'll talk to you again uh, very soon as natural gas and hydrogen continues to develop in our market. My pleasure, Jason. Thanks for having me.